the the, peek. the the passage in uh, First Kings. Crap. The for, uh, prep is unnecessary, so that's fine. <laughs> that's what you said. That was how I went. If you wanted to come prepared, I think I send everybody the the passage. passage so Kings. the Solomon's judgment. Um, um, basically, it's immediately. I don't know if it took place immediately after his dream, um, where God said, basically, I'll grant you one wish. Uh, and he said, um, I don't want uh, riches. I want wisdom. Mm-hmm. And God said, because you've asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you uh, riches as well. And so it, and then it says, he awoke and behold, it was a dream. And then it goes into immediately the next passage in First Kings three fifteen through 27. Uh, would one of you like to read that? Uh, starting in 15? Uh, or just th- 16? Sorry. Uh, 316? Hey, how about that? Three f- yeah, 16. Uh, 316. Then there came... Uh, sorry, I apologize. Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And the one woman said, O oh my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also, and we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night, because she overlaid it. And she arose at midnight, and took my son from beside me, while thine handmaid slept, and laid it in her bosom, and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had consider it, considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. Then said the king, The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is the dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one, and half to the other. Then spake the woman, whose the living child was, unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O my lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. I think any time I've ever heard people talk about this, they talk about how Solomon basically was like miraculously given this wisdom and... It just so happens to to work out, and he's also giving something brand new, like a novel, a novel interpretation of um, a, a novel judgment in terms of what you're supposed to do in this type of situation. But my whole my whole philosophy with how I look at scripture is, um, I try I want to look at scripture with how can I obey this mm. instead of with the presupposition of. How does this not apply to me anymore? Because that's the that's kind of the typical thing that I encounter, especially for a difficult passage. People like I, I've I that was a pastor that brought that up to me um, two or three weeks ago. I started. Uh, he asked me about a very complicated chapter in Numbers five, um, and I was like, "Well, that all depends on your view of such and such." And they're like, "But that's all ceremonial." Like, in other words, yes, I know that that's in the Bible, but we don't have to think about it anymore. So why, why bring it up, in other words? And the, my gut reaction as soon as somebody tells me, like, we don't have to think about that anymore, I, my knee-jerk reaction is, like, that's a cop-out. That's, that's a way to be lazy with the Bible and not really understand, regardless of if we end up at the same place in terms of how we interpret or, or like, what we're supposed to do at the end of the day. My gut reaction is I think most people err on the side of being too relaxed in their view of should I do this or not. 
I'd rather err on the side of, I'm, an, I'm assuming I should do it unless there's a very clear reason I'm either specifically told or, <laughs> or uh, otherwise figure out that I can't, I can't do that anymore because of the new covenant. Like we don't have a physical temple. So like, for example, the nature of sacrifices has changed. We still do daily sacrifices. But Paul says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Uh, Peter says, we're living stones of the temple. Um, So we still, there's still a temple and there's still, but they're better than the temple that they used to have. So they only had a shadow, which was a building and actual blocks. Now we have the real thing, which is God's people knit together in Christ with him as the cornerstone. We're laid on top of him. And we're priests after him. We're a nation of priests, it says in Revelation. So we still have a fully functioning temple sacrificial system, but it's we have a better one than what they had. That's why we don't go back and start killing sheep and goats and, and all that stuff. But the but my assumption is this is all still it's, it all still applies. Like there are still principles that we can get from yeah. you know, a peace office offering versus a sin offering versus a um a wave offering and, and all of those tra- types of things or the Levites getting paid from the sacrifices. They get a piece of it and depending on the type of sacrifice, etc. cetera. Mm-hmm. So I was mulling over, like that's my philosophy, how I come to this text. And I think I was reading through Exodus. So I'll just go ahead and, and give you the, the answer key to what I think Solomon was, uh, what, where Solomon was reading from. <clears throat> Exodus 21, 33 through 36. When a man opens a pit or when a man digs a pit and does not cover it and an ox or a donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit shall make restitution. He shall give money to its owner and the dead beast shall be his. When one man's ox butts another's so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and share its price and the dead beast also they shall share. Or if it is known that the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past, and its owner has not kept it in, he shall repay ox for ox, and the dead beast shall be his. So the middle here, Mm. well, starting at the beginning, this is dealing with when somebody's at fault, they have to correct the mistake and make it right. But then it goes to the next example, which is, what if it's not really anybody's fault? Like, when one man's ox butts another's so that it dies, like, would, would there have been, first of all, neither one of them has had any reason to suspect that one of them was going to be violent because it hasn't done this before. So how can you prevent something that you didn't know was likely to happen? There's really no penalty for it. And also it was basically a coin flip as to which man's ox was going to butt the other ones. The other guy's ox could just as easily has had butted his. So in which case you don't, the, the same laws for restitution don't apply. Like, it wasn't your fault, so you both just need to come away from this perfectly even. Mm -hmm. You split the dead beast, and then you sell the live beast, and you share its price. So that way, yes, there was loss, but you both lost together, because it wasn't really either one of you, neither one of you was at fault. What is y'all's reaction to Solomon applying that to the, the prostitutes? Let me think on that for a second. Because Solomon says... Cut the living child in half and give half to each one of them. So that would be the the equivalence of selling the live ox, basically. And sharing its price, yeah. Solomon's obviously using a, a very colorful version of that, a very dramatic version of that. And I wonder... You can't infer this specifically from the text, but I think Solomon, based on her reaction, Solomon basically using some reverse psychology, what we would call reverse psychology on this this prostitute, realizing that she's really, she's particularly nasty. And I think listening to the two of them bicker, Solomon probably picked up on that and said, if I say cut the child in half, she'll say, go for it. Because at least the other woman won't get what she's come in here for. I'd wondered in the past, and I didn't have anything particular to tie this to, but I'd wondered if the 
the basis of it was something along the idea of a the the nasty woman is she is not it, it almost is irrelevant whose child it actually was because what he's doing is he's he's assigning the child to the uh, the one, the one who would love it most would care for it <laughs> the one who would take care of it the one who would at some level raise it I mean, who knows what that means for the prostitute sure question but I don't know if that's at all reasonable or accurate but I that that was the way that I thought of it heard of it before it was more a a, t a taking responsibility a, a, t a taking care and that leads to more responsibility or care yeah solomon's deduction is whoever reacts that way is the child's mother right which and is probably so true. which which is i think the text does verify that that is what was true but also like like you said if Solomon had thought through all the possible outcomes, like both of the women could have said, no, don't kill the child, in which case he really wouldn't have gained anything by mm -hmm. being so dramatic. <clears throat> both of them could have said, okay, go ahead, which I think Solomon seemed probably would be the most unlikely. That would lead to some other complications. Right. In which case they would basically both have called Solomon on his bluff saying, I didn't really mean for that to actually happen. Hmm. Or it could have been the other way. Maybe the child's mother was actually particularly nasty and didn't really care for her own child. But he can assume because they're bringing this dispute before me, she actually does. They both say that they want the child. Right. Probably at least one of them does. Well, and the other one, she technically would have gotten the child only half of it, though, and dead. So she's like, well, if I can't get the whole thing, I'd set for, settle for half which no mother would, would say that mm -hmm. of her own child. Hmm. I just think that the whole thing is quite funny because two prostitutes come before King Solomon and Solomon's mind immediately goes to what do you do about oxen? So she's comparing these prostitutes' children to oxen. And using the principle there. Mm -hmm. But there's a little bit, I think there's a little bit of a, of a jab at the women for being prostitutes. It's like, oh, you guys are going to sell your bodies like cattle? Well, I'm going to treat you like cattle. Potentially. Oh. Are there other... Are Sorry, there I just caught up to why you're comparing, who you're comparing the oxen to. Okay, I get it. Got it. The, well, in particular, he's comparing the, the, the children of the prostitutes to oxen. Right. Yeah, but... Which would mean which that the prostitutes... a little bit, but yeah. Which would mean that the prostitutes would be oxen as well. Right. It does break it down a little bit when you get to children with some of the other principles. Correct. Like, you can't make... You're not supposed to make sacrifices and... Offer children Offer, to Molech, yes. and obviously, <laughs> I was even thinking of some of the some of the principles surrounding okay. um, children's responsibility for parents and things like that. But I think there could still be a comparison there. Well, technically, there's there's three parties in this this law, right? In this law regarding the oxen in verse thirty five, he said, if one man, well, technically, there's f four parties. If one man's ox, so one man is one party. And the ox, that man's ox is the other party, hurt another's. So then you have two guys and two oxen. So there's the four parties. If one man's ox hurt another's that he die, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the money of it. And the dead ox also they shall divide. And so the two ox you're saying are the two children. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's the actually, two men it's, it's are a, the harlots. 
Yeah, this is a much more simplified version. In the the prostitute case, it's a little bit there's an extra layer there, because technically it's not the two. It, one of the one of their children didn't roll over and suffocate the other one. One of the right. children's mothers rolled over and suffocated her child. Mm -hmm. So actually, I wonder if it would、uh, feed into the next part here about the restitution laws in chapter twenty two. Um, because down here in、uh, gosh, where is it? For verse nine, it says, "For all manner of trespass, whether it be for ox, for ass, for sheep, for raiment, or for any manner of lost thing which another challenges to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges, and whom the judges shall condemn, he shall pay double unto his neighbor." So. It seems like, and this is mostly for like you gave something to somebody, or somebody stole something, and you can prove that it's yours, type of thing. Technically, that woman was not only lying that the child was hers, but she stole the child, and the, she did a switch. She did the switcheroo, and the the woman whose child actually was the live one. She's saying you you owe me my child, and technically she the the girl who killed her or the the lady who stole it should be giving her the child plus extra according to the laws of restitution. Right. Well,、But、the thing if, is, if you want to go、thing. all the way about like kidnapping, if somebody steals a man and sells him, then anybody found in possession of him should be put to death. So in that sense, it possibly and it it doesn't continue on with the example here. In First Kings, maybe Solomon ordered one of the. Maybe he ordered the prostitute to be put to death. Prostitution was already a. I mean, criminal <laughs> matter. So if technically they should have both been stoned, but it, that also well, was left up to the king and the judges to give grace on that matter or not. In my mind, there's a difference between. This plays back to, actually, the next chapter in in Exodus.、Uh, the end of Exodus 22 gets into like. Adultery stuff and、uh, fornication and things like that. Yeah, but in, that, would, in the case if, of if neither one of them of were, if if neither of the prostitutes were ever married, then it wouldn't be adultery. There might still be a penalty involved. Yeah, and if obviously if she was a priest's daughter, then it's death penalty. But if she's not a priest's daughter, then basically she can never present herself as marriageable. Yeah, she would have to stay a prostitute forever, or hopefully stop being a prostitute. But Getting married would open her up to accusation of being unfaithful by her husband at any point. In which case, that、mm. that would be a death penalty. So, I think once you've been a prostitute, the safest thing to do would basically just be just don't ever get married.、Yeah. And there were certain there were certain levels within the priesthood that were not allowed to.、Um, I don't think I don't think any priest at any level could marry a woman who had been defiled. And then the high priest, obviously, he had to marry. A virgin, a virgin, who had never been betrothed before, like not he couldn't even marry a widow. Normal priests could marry widows. I think、mm, I, there might also be an element of、um, two or three witnesses. He may have been using the child as a witness. So, like, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Right? They could never bring a case to the judge, like they could never bring it up to the judges of Israel without having two or three witnesses. You had to have two or three witnesses to establish a case, and in this case, you had、he、only said, one she, witness on got, each she side. She said versus she said, and that's it. He said, he said versus she said. Geez, that's a tongue twister. She, she, she said, said versus, versus she, she said. <laughs> um. But he probably used the live child as the second witness, or in an attempt to you to find a second witness in that case, because that this passage is actually interesting because it specifically points out, or the first woman giving the the says said there is no stranger with us; it was、mm -hmm. only the two of us and our children. And so, to find the second witness to solve the case, he would have had to use the child in its current state. Being a、right. baby, can't speak. He used the child in a way to act as the second witness in the case. I don't know if I could go that far. Maybe. What was the unclear situations 
passage that you referenced earlier, because I, that was something that was coming to my mind. But beginning of Exodus 22. Uh, in Exodus 22, there's a um, it talks oh, about right. restitution of um, just things that are lost, or if you let somebody borrow something, if somebody steals something, or if you find something that belongs right. to somebody else, so on and so forth. Uh, but verse 9 was the one I was uh, reading, or for all manner of trespass, whether it's for ox, for ass, for sheep, for raiment, for any manner of lost thing, which another challengeth to be his, the cause of both parties shall come before the judges. And whom the judges shall condemn, he shall pay double unto his neighbor. Now that's interesting. My translation reads very different of that, which tells me that's one of the reasons that I started learning Hebrew. Because I would like to know what is the, so mine reads, um, for every breach of trust, whether it is for an ox, for a donkey, for a sheep, for a cloak, or for any kind of lost thing of which one says, this is it. The case of both parties shall come before God. The one whom God condemns shall pay double to his neighbor. So I wonder what the original word is there. I, God or judge. The well, ESV has God throughout and I've always heard it as judge before. I have ESV right here, too. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, ESV. Uh, I, I usually have read King James, New King James. And it, it was, it's always judge there. Like this whole this whole chapter is you bring it before God. For raiment, for... Well, the interesting thing so is... Making, okay, this is the... This is one fun part about the word Elohim. <laughs> uh, so this word is Elohim. Um, but Elohim is not necessarily because this the this word Elohim also gets used um, in context when referring to Abraham, um, and I believe this is after he rescues Lot. Um, but they basically say, "We know that you are a mighty man." The, mm -hmm. the kings are talking to Abraham, and they say, "We know that you are a mighty man." They say, like, "We know that you are an Elohim, right? Like a strong man." Or a, a great man. And so Elohim in that case gets used as a, a, sub, a superlative word to describe somebody. You're not to necessarily God. say, uh, like, it's the God, right? Right. It's, it's just saying, but in this case, the judges, he, he gave them to be, he gave them judges. He told them that they would have judges, or, well, that's one of the things that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which Jethro recommended to Moses, and even says that Jethro said the good thing to have the judges over, you know, thousands and hundreds and tens. Yeah, so the word can be, I'm, I'm looking at a lexicon here, the word, it very often refers to God, sometimes it's used to refer to angels, and then sometimes it can just refer to rulers or judges, mm -hmm. but it's but it does always it apparently it does always seem to have in, in view like as a representative of God, mm -hmm. like this person gets their authority from God, which mm -hmm. we know Paul says like uh, submit to rulers as unto the Lord, because mm -hmm. all power comes from God, and those who have, those who are in authority have been given authority by God. Yeah. So obviously that would apply to a judge. Well, it also, um, there's a psalm about this that even Jesus quotes when he's talking to the Pharisees. Um, let me look it up real quick. Um, uh, psalm 82, uh, verse 6, he says, but I'll read verse 5. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. But this is, Jesus actually quotes this one to the Pharisees. Because they say, you're claiming to be God. And Jesus says, well, you know, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> he basically, he basically kind of backpedals his deity, at least in that instance. Because he's like, I said, you are God, sons of the most high, all of you. Well, they were made in his image. I think that's probably the point that he was getting at, but... You're given his authority. Uh, what about Psalm 82? Let's make sure, because I'm pretty sure that word is also Elohim. Yeah, Elohim's. Is it in that passage? In 82, 82? verse 6, hmm. yeah. Well, it is interesting 
because Jesus talks about us as being, or not Jesus, but I think it's Paul that says that we're brothers of Christ. Mm -hmm. Christ is a son of God, and we're brothers of Christ, and we're also sons of God. Which they tried to stone Jesus for saying, I'm the son of the son of God. And they said, Jesus, they tried to stone him, and Jesus said, For which of my good works do you stone me? And you said, Not for your good works, but you being a man, you make yourself out to be God. Well, they did they said, You make yourself out to be God after Jesus said, I'm I and the Father are no no no. He said, I think he just said, I am son of God. Which, to a Hebrew culture, saying that you were a son of something meant you were that thing, mm -hmm. basically. Sons of thunder. Oh, this is a nice verse. <laughs> this this kind of goes back to your, uh, I guess, not your presupposition, but your angle from which you approach scripture. But this is the part where Jesus is telling them the God's thing. He says, the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. This is actually that exact passage. So he says, many good works have I showed you from my father, for which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If ye called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken... <laughs> Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and hath sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. <laughs> I have a better memory, maybe, than I give myself credit for. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> better than I give and sometimes worse. <laughs> so always double check me. I like the, the scripture cannot be broken. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I might as well quote the Matthew 5 passage. Oh, the... What, where he talks about like what, how how highly did Jesus think of the law? I should I should as a believer in Christ I should at least think of the Scripture as highly as Jesus did. Yeah. Not one jot or tittle shall pass away from the law until all be fulfilled. But and not only that, but listen to how he says the people who either esteem it highly will be treated, and then the people who don't esteem it highly will be treated. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Strangely enough, as an aside, I think most people think of the word fulfill as mm -hmm. a synonym of having done away with, which Jesus says they're opposites. If I fill this bottle, does the bottle disappear when it's full? Or would it be more disastrous if the bottle were to disappear after it's full versus before I filled it? You'd leave a much bigger mess if the bottle disappeared after it was already full. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, and this is where he says how people are going to be treated based on what how they treat the law. Whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Mm. And that's a passage that, that I can't get around. We have a, we could have like an entire other discussion about the uh, continuance of the law, I should say. <laughs> um, but well, we were getting into like when you first got here earlier before we started recording, talking about the feasts and festivals, and my understanding and it has always been, and it still currently is. Feasts and festivals, I think, are a great uh, teaching tool. But I think the New, New Testament makes it clear that they are optional. Because Paul says, one man esteems one day as higher than another. Another man esteems all days alike. Let each be convinced in his own mind. To his own master, he stands or falls. In Romans 14? Is that the, is that the reference? I think you're talking about Romans 14. It could be that one. Um, but what the, the, the context of Romans 14 is yeah, interesting Romans because he's 14 talking verse about five. one person esteems one day as better than another while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. 
And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Mm -hmm. But what, what's the very opening verse of verse of chapter 14? Yeah, this is talking about uh, meat sacrifice to idols in the what, context, I think. What's the first mm -hmm. verse talking about? For the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. Opinions. There's a key word there. So the entire context of chapter 14 is talking about opinions in reference to whether one should eat or fast. Because what he's, what, what he's actually referencing is some are saying I should fast on this day while others are saying I shouldn't fast on this day. Or like I don't know if I should be fasting or if I don't know if I should be eating vegetarian or meats or whatever like that. And so what Paul is discussing in, uh, and he opens up the context with is matters of opinion. Basically, it was like, don't quarrel over matters of opinion. What he's not calling a matter of opinion, though, because it's not a matter of opinion, is the law of God. The law of God is just, it's the law of God. He said so. Like, what dad said is not a matter of opinion. It's stated. If God gives you leeway for a matter of opinion because he didn't specifically spell it out, then it's a matter of opinion, right? It's, okay, I don't know if I should fast this day, but... That also had to do with the traditions of men because some of the Pharisees and Sadducees were um, fasting uh, once or twice a week, right? And it's like, well, should I fast this often? Or, or Because they even came to Jesus with this question. It's like, why do the uh, disciples of John and the Pharisees fast often, but your, yours don't? And he's like, well... I'm the bridegroom. I'm the bridegroom, and while I'm with them... What wedding feast do you know of where people don't eat? <laughs> yeah, while I'm with them, they're not going to fast, but the days will come when they do fast. But there was no, never a prescribed, other than certain days... I think a, just the Day of Atonement, maybe. Redeemed, yes. Depending on your interpretation of what afflicted, of you shall afflict yourselves means. Yeah, okay, right. that's a whole other discussion. Other than uh, specified days where he... Uh, it specifically states you should, you should fast, and I'm pretty sure that's the only one that can ever be interpreted as a specified day of fasting. Anything else is a matter of opinion of when you want to fast because mm -hmm. you're fasting for the Lord for some reason. Well, he doesn't reference fasting here. He references whether you eat meat or not. Eat meat or eat vegetables. Meat. Vegetables, eat, right. Whether or not you're going to be a vegetarian or eat. But it's all a matter of opinion. But the Which thing Paul is not saying about days and observing days is the law of God is not a matter of opinion. God has stated to observe Sabbath. God has stated to observe the appointed days because they're his appointed days, which leave, takes them out of the context. Mm -hmm. Those days are now appointed, sanctified, set, afide, or set apart by God as not matters of opinion. You shall do this. So it takes, it takes the Sabbath, it takes those days out of the context of chapter 14, and they're not touchable. Plus, if Paul was actually teaching that those commandments were matters of opinion, he would be breaking the commandment of not adding to or taking away from the law of God. Not to get too far away on a, on yeah, a rabbit sorry. trail. Yeah. <laughs> but I think there'd be some, I'd have some pushback on that. I think the day is very tied in and paralleled to the, the food I. I think there are certain, the Sabbath continues. I think it's from creation, um, but the other specifics of the days, so the Old Testament festivals or the church calendar today, um, are lawful. They may be helpful, and they should not be bludgeons. They we should not be bludgeons. We shouldn't beat each other up about them. Do you celebrate the church calendar or not? We can talk about it. Is it helpful? Is it not? But it that's that's the matter of opinion. Do you observe something of the old covenant? holidays, that's, with all the parameters of Galatians in place, that's a matter of opinion. Not well, it's not a matter of opinion. And and this is actually what I was getting into when before we even started, uh, the, when we were talking about earlier, is these misconceptions about how we interpret Paul, about what he's saying. Because if you go into it with the presupposition that the law has, is capable of being changed, that the law has been changed or uh, needed to be changed in some way, then, then you read that into because you're unstable or unlearned, which Peter says, and those who read Paul are, it's, he's hard to understand for those who are unstable and unlearned, and therefore they read Paul and they twist his words because they're lawless men. Mm -hmm. They do not have the law, right? 
And so we need to be careful when we're interpreting Paul to make sure that we're not bringing in the presuppositions or our own bias into it because Paul has to preach, whatever he preaches has to line up with the scripture that they had to verify Paul with. Oh yeah, the way the Bereans would search things out. The Bereans would weigh Paul by scripture. Um, and also, the way that Paul would use the law, Paul would, there's that place in, I think it's in uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, where Paul says, here's why you need to pay those who minister to you. Mm -hmm. because you're not supposed to tr muzzle an ox that treads out the grain. Yeah. A worker is worthy of his wages. Bring Paul, it full circle. <laughs> Paul, Paul said, like, is it with oxen that God is primarily concerned about? He asked a rhetorical question, and I think the answer would be no. Yeah. God's more concerned. Jesus said, like, you know, you buy two sparrows for a penny, and you're worth many sparrows. Mm -hmm. So if God gives this law in, in the case of oxen, and make sure you pay your oxen, for their work, well, then it would definitely apply to a man working. And ministers should be worthy of double honor, so you should probably pay them, figure out what a reasonable rate would be, and pay him double. Um, and But Paul is using stuff in, most people would think of as like, maybe not super applicable animal husbandry code stuff in the Torah. And Paul is using that to say, no, like, of course this is all still relevant. Like, why would you think it would not be? I think that's Paul's attitude, basically. Paul can ab appeal to obscure, lesser known, at least by today's standards, obscure standards in the law and say, the church needs to be built on this principle. Well, and bringing it first full circle to your, your point about the Exodus uh, 21 passage, I mean, you got your precedent there of Paul using a passage about oxen relating to men and then bringing it back to Solomon's wisdom that God gave him and using the passage about the oxen and splitting it in half to divide it, right? And referencing that back to the child and to the harlots. Mm. So I think Solomon could have equivalently, equivalently, oh geez. I he could have equivocated. Speak. There you go. He could people, have done the people same and exact, animals. He could have done If it applies to animals, the same principle needs to apply to people. And that's exactly what Solomon did. And maybe somebody else has written and made this connection before, but I was just reading through this passage and I can't remember if my Bible reading lined up. I don't think I read those two passages like on the same day or even the same month. Sure. I just had it in the back of my mind and I was like, what story does this make me think of? And for whatever reason, this is probably you know, a year ago, and I just couldn't stop thinking about it. So I'm like, I have to, I need to record this with some people of me, like, talking this out and, like, does it make sense or is it too outlandish a connection to make? Um, but if Paul is, forget forget the New Testament. I know it's a bad thing to say. Forget <laughs> the New Testament for a second because Solomon knows nothing of the New Covenant at this point. Um, or does he? Jeremiah. <laughs> Jeremiah is kind of the key past, key prophet talking about the new covenant, and Jeremiah hadn't come yet. But what is Jeremiah saying? Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Never mind. More rabbit trails. Well, I like rabbit trails, but um, Paul's using... Uh, Paul. Um, Solomon has the law. Yeah. It's finite. It's done. It's Moses. Like, yeah. And he, they're, they're walking through... Maybe they had a few other things. Like, obviously, they would have had the book of Job... Um, and a few other things, but they have the Torah. In, they have in, the instructions. In First Kings, like we, we really haven't even gotten to the place where there's very many prophets yet, at least not that we have their writings of. So it's a very limited compared to what we have, book of commandments that Solomon's got. And so, if he's going to look, if God says he's the wisest person ever, is that not going to include specific insight about the law yeah. of Moses? Well, I mean, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And I mean, that, mm -hmm. and, and having the fear of the Lord means you're respecting, and it's not, I think we've all heard this, like it's the reverential type of fear, but why do you revere him or how do you revere somebody who's your father? And I mean, 
we obey their commandments. <laughs> if you love me, you obey my commandments, he says. Right? And so part of the wisdom of Solomon is that he obeyed the Lord's com- Well, he had the wisdom in to most obey places, the commandments. In many places. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he, w- he would have known how to apply the Torah. And, and outside of the Torah, outside of the what Moses gave, there were no new commandments. They had to be based off of what was given at Sinai, what Moses gave them. Anything that came after that was to be tested against the Torah and had to line up with. Otherwise, it was adding to or taking away. Deuteronomy 12, 32, I think. Right? Yeah, don't add, don't add or take away from this book of the law. I'm interested, Justin, how you would respond to uh, Jesus basically saying that the priests profane the temple, temple and are guiltless. Uh, beginning, of, day. beginning of Matthew 12. Uh, at the time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David... It, it's funny that Jesus doesn't say, Oh, oh, my bad. Or obviously he can't say that because he can't sin. But obvious, but he also doesn't say, um, yes, what we're doing is lawful. He doesn't just basically say, uh-uh. Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? So basically Jesus is holding up an example of David doing something he wasn't supposed to do. But nobody would point at David and say, that was evil, David, because the Pharisees didn't. They recognized that given the circumstances, yes, it wasn't lawful for him to do, but David was blameless. In that whole circumstance, too, Saul said, this is evil, and used it to do all kinds of things, and was condemned for that. Saul was technically correct. He was the king. He was missing something, clearly. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So what does it mean? He doesn't just say the priests uh, the priests break the Sabbath and are guiltless, or the priests work on the Sabbath and are guiltless. He specifically says, no, what the priests are doing is profaning the Sabbath. Well, what is and, the law of and the Sabbath? And they're guiltless. Yeah, well, what's the law of the Sabbath? The law of the Sabbath is that for the general person, for the genu- general populace, it's uh, you shall not do any work, you nor your uh, manservant or your maidservant or your your ox or your ass, like you will rest on the day because that's what I did. Copy me, right? But then the priests don't but do the that. Priests because there are commandments. Commanded they're commanded to, to work in the temple. Mm-hmm. They're commanded to give burnt offerings and offer up the continual burnt offering. Plus, there was the morning sacrifice, the morning the and the sacrifice, evening sacrifice, and stoking plus the fire throughout the, the day. Sacrifice, right. which it's was a, double, a special thing. It's a double sacrifice. So they're just working their tails off. Yeah. And it's like, do, well, the problem is, is what they. What he was always addressing when it came to the Pharisees and Sadducees, 100% of their time was their oral law, was the the Talmud, the Mishnah, everything that they added extra. Because he says in Mark 7, if I can get there really quick, he tells them, uh, ba 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 well, hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain <laughs> do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such things, uh, such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth mother, father or mother, let him die the death. But if ye say, if, 
But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free, and ye suffer him no more to do aught for his mother, to, for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which ye have delivered, and many such like things ye do. So his point to the Pharisees and Sadducees was always, I hate your doctrines and traditions. I hate everything that you've added or taken away from the law of God because you bind heavy burdens on people that they're not able to keep, that you wouldn't even lift with your pinky. His, his point to the Pharisees and Sadducees was always their oral tradition, always the doctrines and traditions of men. And so what they were considering work by the Pharisees' own law, by their oral tradition, by their law, the priests were profaning the Sabbath. By the Pharisees, the um, by their law, the Pharisees and Sadducees would be profane because they're working. But to say that the law says that the priests are profaning the Sabbath would be a contradiction because God is telling them to sin against him. him. They're, he's telling them to intentionally sin. Well, it's the whole thing with Jesus becoming sin on our behalf. So in that sense, the body of Christ was profaned, but it was on purpose in, in order to achieve salvation. The same thing for somebody working to offer a sacrifice. It might have been profane, but because you're a priest and you're doing it the way you're supposed to do it. God told you the, to. <laughs> the priest, the priest uh, didn't have an inheritance in the land like the... Uh, oh, broke my rubber band. I'm sorry. They're so expensive. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I bought, I bought a, uh, I use these for tying up the microphone cables and stuff and they're all multicolor. They're like way too cute. So I bought, and they break, these ones break really easily. I found them at Walmart. So I bought a little, um, little bottle of like 2000 rubber bands and I think it was like $4.99 on Amazon. Like to have it shipped here was $4.99. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, the whole, the whole thing of a priest offering a sacrifice on behalf of the people, but it's somehow, it's ple it's pleasing to God for somebody else to take responsibility for somebody else's wrongdoing. I think that's the whole pattern. Job was spoken of as a righteous man because he offered sacrifices just in case his children had done something wrong. And God viewed, God thought, view, viewed that very favorably. Not to excuse his children and say like, oh, may, may sin increase that, uh, grace, grace may abound. abound. It's almost like he just said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. <laughs> but have you known this? Have you ever read any part of scripture? You would know this, he tells them. Yeah, obedience in the first place is always better than disobedience with the intent of making up for it or having somebody else make up for it later. Well, it, yeah, the, the sacrifice, and the funny thing too about it is he says, when he desires obedience rather than sacrifice. Well, obedience is giving sacrifice because he said to give sacrifices, right? He's not saying that I don't want you to give sacrifices. I don't want your sacrifices to come before your obedience. I don't want the works of the law. I want your faith first and then your obedience because your obedience comes from your faith, from your love. Because you love me, out of your faith for me, of me, and in me, I obey you. So he's always proven throughout the, the Torah even too that salvation comes by faith alone. And then in James, we have, you have to, your faith has to look like something. It should look like something and God has spelled out what it looks like. Yeah, that's the whole thing in James is not, it's not, works or no works it's living faith versus dead faith is the dichotomy so it's faith with works versus faith with faith without works it, james talks about them as both being faith but it's one's a living faith and one's a dead faith and obviously the dead faith is not worth anything yeah. but living faith has works by definition yeah. and john in first john Chapter 5, I don't know, verse 10 or 12 or something like that. He says the commandments of God are not grievous. And the issue with, and this comes back to the misinterpretations of Paul, is the, the issue that we have is when he's talking about many different laws in the context of Romans, when he's addressing a bunch of different laws, he's calling the law bondage. 
And so the funny question is, is then, okay, well, let's just be serious about this. Is the law of God therefore bondage? The like, law is all very counterintuitive because if you hate it, then it's a burden. And if you love it, then it's freedom. But that's it's like the if thing, you run from the cops. That's <laughs> what Paul points out is when you hate the law, you're not following the law of God. You're following the law of sin and you're under the captivity of the, under, of the law of sin. And therefore following the law of sin, which is enmity before God, is captivity. It's bondage. But David describes the law as liberty in his Psalms, in Psalm 119, right? He says, I walk after the law and it's liberty to me. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, so, but. Yeah, it's also interesting, and I think this was a James Jordan uh, talk. The way we think of law is a very, like in our Western thing, we would think of of the law of God as relatively incomplete because it it, there's like, it gives you these pinpoint examples, but it's not exhaustive. It's not an exhaustive list of rules. The way we would think of like the law code of the state of Texas or a federal law code where it's like it basically tries to cover every single possible situation and what to do so that there's there is as little doubt as possible. As we find out about how to pay your pastor from uh, husbandry loss. Yeah. 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 Why isn't there anything explicit in there about like pay your rabbi? There's nothing. Like, you have to infer that. And you're also not supposed to go beyond what the law says, but then we're also supposed to extrapolate. <laughs> but that's the beauty But that's the beauty of the fact that the law of God is liberty. It's like, to, uh, for me, all things are lawful. Not all things are expedient for me to do, right? It's like the law of God is liberty because he doesn't... <clears throat> there's something out there that's, uh, that talks about there being 613 laws in the Torah. It's like, really? There's not. There's, you have to be very nitpicky about doing this because in my past uh, recent readings of like Leviticus or Deuteronomy, I made a point of going through and every time that there was a law listed, I would list it out like in a short little sent one line sentence of like, what is this law saying? And like tried to list them out and enumerate them as I went through them. I didn't get more than 50 I didn't get up to close to a hundred of these things when I enumerated them versus Exodus and uh, Deuteronomy, and then some of them are basically just repeats and numbers in Leviticus. Well, or they're expounding on the law. You might have had very uh, stringent qualifications for what makes something a commandment or not, because I counted death penalties, and there's there's over eighty, but just he, death penalties. But okay, but the thing is, is like those are those are judgments. It's because there's a distinction between commandments and statutes and judgments, right? There's the... I think of them all as synonyms because of how David used them in 119, Psalm 119. Are they synonyms, though? Because, because every verse in 119 has a different word for commandment or law or... But take our, so, but take our current day laws. Like, when you go to a specific law for Idaho State, right, it's... Idaho state law, of, you know, 14.2.3. I don't know, whatever, right? But it's all one law. It just has stipulations on on how to handle this law. But it's all one law, is it not? These aren't different laws. It's just stipulations on how to handle that law. So the death penalty then falls under the stipulation of, in certain contexts, this is how you handle this certain thing. So when the two people and the two or three witnesses come before the judges, they know how to handle it. Otherwise, they have the umim and thumim, or urim and thurim, whatever umim I can. Umim and thumim. Yeah, they cast lots. They ask God, oh, how do I well, deal with this one? Because I can't figure it out. <laughs> it's not lots, but yeah. that's some nebulous stuff there. Sure. Kind of mm -hmm. like Nephilim. Yeah. <laughs> What were they? <laughs> well, the whole thing about what Torah means, Torah doesn't necessarily mean law in the way we would think of a law code. It really means more like teaching. Instruction. Instruction. So, like, what what um, what law code can you think of, like, of any state in the United States where it starts talking about why a certain law is the way it is? There basically is never any reason given. It just says do this and don't do this. But you get into the stuff of, like, uh, the commandment that says when you... If a, if a poor man lends you his cloak and you're supposed to give him back, give him back that at sunset. His, his and then it says, 
And then, yeah. yeah. And then the law goes into, for in what else shall he sleep? Right. Like it starts, the, law, the, the, the Torah starts asking rhetorical questions amidst its commandments. And so, like, what law code is it? They're like, so in that sense, in the pure Western sense of like, we like to have everything like so cut and dried into its constituent parts versus thinking about things more Eastern, they're more thinking about like, what's your attitude? towards this. And I think God's God's commandments has both of those thought processes together, which is why I like to say his commandments were given to people in the not the east, not the west, but the Middle East. <laughs> That's great. And it, you know, one of the things I've been noticing about the new covenant, um, the new covenant speech, and I'm trying to find it, is it Isaiah 31, 36 or something. I can't remember what the, the new covenant, the, the, like the, oh, here the it is. primary it's one is 31, 31. He says, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Also, that word can be renew covenant. But anyways, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. <clears throat> But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And we, so we take, we've taken hold of the new covenant, which it's established and in, in pieces has been fulfilled, I believe. Like we've been, the and you can read this again in Ezekiel 36, I think. I can't remember where it is. Um, but in Ezekiel, um, he says, I'm going to put, in Ezekiel, he says, I'm going to put my spirit in them. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take away their stony heart and put in them a new heart. Right? But what is he putting on the heart? He's putting his Torah on the heart. He's not saying that the, he's never said that the issue with the covenant was his law. It was the people who didn't, it, it was the stony heart of the people that was the problem, which is why the new covenant had to, the purpose of the new covenant is to replace the stony heart with the, fle the heart of flesh and then write the law that he already gave us mm -hmm. on the flesh. There's a really neat, neat uh, parallel when God gives the commandments to Moses, the actual stone tablets, mm -hmm. the, the law written on stone. When he gives them to Moses the first time, there's there's a, a first covenant giving of the law and a second covenant giving of the law to Moses. The first time, God gives them to Moses, and Moses goes down, sees the people's idolatry, and smashes them. So the first covenant is the law broken. Mm -hmm. The new covenant, Moses takes those, he puts them into the Ark of the Covenant, which then eventually find their place in the heart of the temple, inside the Holy of Holies. So what does the temple represent? We are the temple of God. Do you not know that you're the temple of God? Yeah. So the first covenant is the law broken. The new covenant is the law placed in the heart. But what happened with the second law? It was the exact same law. Mm -hmm. He went back up and God rewrote it all again. No, no, no. No, he spoke to Moses and Moses wrote the second copy himself. I thought that too, but I went back and read it and God writes it again. God wrote it again, it says. I think I'm pretty sure it says that he spoke to Moses and Moses wrote the same What is this? Exodus? Uh, know, Exodus 18, maybe. Okay, chapter 34. Oh, second tables of stone. Uh, chapter 34. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables, right. which thou breakest. So God says, I'm going to do it, but then continue reading. Uh, let me see. Yeah, but he said too. he would do it and be ready in the morning and come up and he and he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables of stone. Verse skip to verse twenty seven. Twenty seven. Let's look. Okay, because this that was, and the Lord said to Moses, write these words for after the tenor of these words have I made a covenant with thee and with Israel. Uh, so he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. And he wrote either. upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And he was there with the Lord. He did neither eat. Okay. Well, question is, is did Moses also, was that the case then? 
with the first table. Well, it's it's kind of like well, so you when I'm when I'm writing this when I'm writing this down, is it my pen that's writing it, or is it me that that writes it? I think the Bible often speaks in that kind of language. He was writing. Moses was writing the direct words of God, whereas he sometimes was stenographer. And we are, <laughs> yeah. Whereas but it was the, God the rest who wrote of scripture it. is not necessarily the. Um, sometimes it is. Sometimes it says, "This is what God said." That's and true. sometimes it's not like, well, the historical books. The the pen had its own voice as well, and you even see that like the the way that the prophecies are is not the same. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah are so very different. So the the inspiration is not necessarily is it verbatim what do you mean by verbatim perhaps but it's not like it isn't it isn't this is exactly what god said in that sense necessarily whereas here i think you could say maybe that's what he's saying god says god is saying it you're writing it down more so than in most situations Mm -hmm. yeah i'm looking at the deuteronomy and also it said earlier that the second table the second set had the exact same words as the first set well, and I will write, and I made an ark of shit and wood. Okay, so this is so De- <coughs> Moses is the one writing, right? Deuteronomy from the first person mm-hmm. until Joshua takes over at the very end. Yeah. And so chapter ten says, "At that time the Lord said unto me, yes. Hew thee two. So unto me, Moses, hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me, God, in the mount, and make thee an ark of wood, and I, God." Uh, will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest, and thou shalt put them in the ark. And I, Moses, made an ark of shittim wood, and hewed two tables of stone like unto the first, and went up into the mount, having the two tables in mine hand. And he, God, wrote on the tables according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you, the people, in the mount of the midst of the fire, in the day of the assembly. And the Lord gave them unto me. So in the Deuteronomy sense, when he's recounting what happened, Moses claims that God told him, make two tablets of stone, come back up, and I'll write them down again. And then God wrote on them. And he says, and he wrote them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the Exodus version, it says that Moses transcribed them. Right. Right? And he was there with the Lord, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the... So the question is, is... In verse 28, when it says, And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, who is the he in Exodus? Mm. It's like, is it saying, And he, Moses, wrote it, or And he, the Lord, wrote it? I'm not sure what the grammar on that would be in the... It's just interesting, though, the, the Exodus 34 passage, where would God say to Moses, Write these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you. So God says... All right, Moses, write this down, and then God writes it. Giving him credit? I don't know. Uh, the point it might the main point is, is despite who wrote it, who had to write the second set, it was the same words mm-hmm. that were in the first set. So the law never changed. There was nothing wrong with mm-hmm. the law. The reason why the law got broke in the first place was because of the people. <laughs> it was because of the sin of the people. Right. Which was an, a prophetic indication of what was about to happen. To the hearts of stone. It was mm-hmm. that the heart of stone would be broken, and then it would be written again the same exact way. Right. Well, you would think that, well, the whole the whole reason that they needed to be written on, God wrote them on tablets of stone, saying, when you write something on stone, it doesn't just go away. This is here forever. But then, ironically, the temple was destroyed, and the, the Ark of the Covenant we don't know what happened to it. It's destroyed or lost or, or whatever. Depends if you and so, are into apocryphal readings or not. <laughs> okay, well, and also what your take is on Indiana Jones. <laughs> <laughs> they got it right, man. No, I'm just kidding. But the whole thing it's is actually that... actually in a warehouse somewhere in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> With some Nazi paraphernalia on, on underneath it or to the sides of it. Um, yeah, the, the whole thing about something being written on stone, meaning this does not change. And it's everlasting. But also stone, like, but then God likens our hearts to being stone, mm-hmm. and that's bad. But then he you writes... You think stone would be great. God could write it on there and it wouldn't go... But then you write the law on the heart, 
the law written on stone basically means that you won't do it. But then the law written on flesh means that you actually will carry it out. But we all know tattoos fade. <laughs> Not this one. I don't, it's I don't empowered by the Spirit of God. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the ironic thing is that, um, what is it, the day uh, right Pe Pentecost was, is the day to celebrate the giving of the law to <clears throat> Moses. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Shavuot, I don't know if it was supposed to be that, if Shavuot was the giving of the law. The giving of the law was potentially Yom Terah when the, I, I'm not sure because there's not a lot of indication about what the, the memorial of blowing trumpets is supposed to be about in Yom Terah. But you could liken the memorial of blowing trumpets to the, the sound that they heard that was like trumpets at Mount Sinai when the Lord descended and spoke to them there. I've just thought it was interesting that if Pentecost is referring to the giving of the law, that'd well, be interesting. The, well, the temple was destroyed shortly after the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. Well, the temple being destroyed, well, the law was in there, or at least was was originally designed to be. And so, wait a minute, but I thought God's law lasts forever. But then the day of Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in the heart. And so now you've got something that he will come and teach the you the things that leaves. I commanded you. <laughs> Remind you, yeah. The light leaves the temple and moves to the people. Because now we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Where the, the temple, which is God's people, is the true, the ultimate dwelling place. Mm -hmm. Which the tattle, the temple, in you know, or the tabernacle in the wilderness, and then eventually Solomon's temple, and then eventually uh, um, Herod's temple. Uh, we're all we're always temporary, pointing towards God actually dwelling in in people. But it's but also it's because still, we have His commandments in our in our hearts. But it still points to that. I, I at least okay. I believe it still points to that. I believe that Ezekiel's temple vision has yet to occur, and therefore, to I believe that I have no problem with the spiritual the spiritualization of the Lord living dwelling in us like literally right like we're the temple of god but i also don't think that that necessarily negates of the second or the third physical temple coming to reality i think god because i believe this is temple. i believe that's not only sets up the conditions for the end end the end when he'll come back and reign but it seems to indicate that that'll be there and that he'll come to dwell among us. My understanding is that but Ezekiel's is getting into eschatology, and we don't have time for that. <laughs> yeah, no, we can, we can, we can be done. I'm still recording. I don't know if I, if this would be any good or not. But you know, take bits um, and pieces. <laughs> the whole take me out of context. Don't worry. <laughs> Ezekiel's uh, Ezekiel's whole thing about the third temple. I think what Ezekiel was seeing, God God meant to be instruction about like what the new covenant would look like without revealing everything the way it was going to be to Ezekiel. He's still revealing it in the pictures that are being used at the time. And so if you take his vision and apply what he's talking about to God's people, the church, then I think you have a full understanding. I the reason you can see I that in Revelation with the temple descending from heaven um, which could arguably could potentially also be the third temple. I think he's still using the the imagery of a temple, which was, regardless whether the temple was actively standing or not, at that point was still the imagery that people knew best. And it's a, like, it is not a, I think it's relatively reasonable to say that it's not a physical temple that will one day exist. Why not? Because it doesn't particularly work physically. Why not? It could, but it would be very, very unlikely well, for so something that shape and size to to, first, to physically exist in the world as it is made now. For God one, for one thing, <laughs> when when they had the temple, you were not it allowed makes more to sense do not to see it as pictorial. When they had the temple, you were not allowed to do sacrifices anywhere else except for the temple. So mm -hmm. if you've got a temple on earth. That would, if if there ever happens to be a rebuilt temple, then all believers need to move within travel distance of that temple. Or it means something well, different. Or else you just can no longer have or to sacrifice. It means something different because we don't have, we don't, we're not to do sacrifices anymore. The sacrifices are complete. 
Mm-hmm. As far as the animals, because that, that would be going back to, I think, the shadows. Yeah. We have the reality, which right. the New Covenant talks about. We have about. to remember not all of the sacrifices were for sin atonement. Some of them Christ were Thanksgiving. Christ was not simply for sin atonement either. Yeah. But it was a sin off- Christ was a sin offering and a peace offer- offering. He was not a free will offering. I don't think you could say that by any stretch. Unless he went maybe, freely, you could maybe maybe maybe. I mean, God could have because what, what, what did he offer freely? He offered himself, and we're called. But we're also called to offer ourselves. We're not called to offer our sheep. But also, God had prom- promised him a long time ago, with you know in Genesis. So could God have said like, at, at least maybe be, maybe in Genesis, God pledging to offer Christ was a free will offering at that time. But then ever since then, it's not a free will offering because he's been pledged. Christ says that he he gives himself freely. I don't remember exactly where. Um, just because you promised to do it and you stuck with it doesn't mean it's not free. Let me, let me I'm going to drop this one because I actually have to go pick up my kids. But consider this. Go back and read Acts 21, verses 17 through 26. But consider this. This is post-ascension. This is basically wrapping up Acts, right? This is Paul going to Jerusalem. Um, So post-ascension, post all of this time, the temple's still standing. It says, Then Paul took the men, and the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. So Paul, in all of his wisdom going around, writing letters to all the Gentiles and Jews, telling them that the law has been abolished, it doesn't need to be done anymore, so on and so forth, still goes to make the sacrifices in the temple for his vow that he took along with these four other guys that James asked him to do because they were falsely accusing him of dropping the commandments of Moses. They were still accomplishing sacrifices and offerings, at least, of in the temple at the time, and Paul didn't seem to have an issue with this. He, he says that he doesn't have an issue with it when he's writing to the Gentiles as well. He doesn't condemn offering sacrifices but why as doesn't such, Paul... but he condemns offering them for your redemption. And, yeah, and, and, and then this wasn't about, them. and I'm not talking and, about salvation. And, and requiring them as well. Well, I'm not talking about salvation, but what this, what this chapter implies his obedience on Paul's behalf toward the Torah, toward the sacrificial system even, and that if Paul really truly believed, as we like to proclaim he did, that he, he proclaimed the, the abolishment or the changing of the law and the fact that all of these things changed with uh, Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, so on and so forth, then why doesn't Paul just tell James, and this is, I have to, I can't even get the answer to this question, but why doesn't Paul just tell James, like, pack sand, man? Like, why doesn't he just, at the, okay, so he had the courage or the boldness to approach Peter and be like, hey, bro, why are you disassembling with the Gentiles now that you see the Jews coming around? Like, he approached Peter about this, yet when James asked him to go take this vow according to the law to show that people's false accusations of him not following the law weren't true, why doesn't Paul just say, James, bro, the law is done away with. Don't you know we don't have to do the sacrificial system anymore? This is all meaningless. Like, why, am I, why are we doing this? Yet there's no record of this. Because the common sense, if we want to take it at that, is that Paul still followed the law as it was meant to be written. And until the destruction of the temple, there was a Levitical priesthood. And in fact, Hebrews even writes that, or because there was a Levitical priesthood and the ability to accomplish the sacrificial system, not for the sake of salvation or for the sake of forgiveness of sins. I'm not sure about that one. I'm not sure. But there seemed to still be a use for the Levitical priesthood and the temple until its destruction. And once the destruction happened, it's like, well, that part of the law cannot be done because the temple, the tabernacle is not there, right? Well, I would argue that it can, it can be in a, in a in more full sense. In a more full sense. Well, I would say, 
most people think of spiritual as being like ethereal. Oh, sure. But like I think of spiritual as being, you know, spiritual is more important than physical. Yeah, well, like, that's all. It's that's always been the case. But that the the case of I desire obedience and not sacrifice. The the case for God has always been: I want you to obey me out of faith. I want this to be written on your heart. I want the circumcision of the heart. Okay, and I will do that for you. But what I want you to do in your daily lives is to live out the fact that I've circumcised your heart. I want you to be witnesses to me. Like I want you to have fruit that shows me that you're obeying my commandments. Well, getting back to your point about Paul, and I'll, and I'll let you go. Um, the Pharisees kept accusing Paul of saying, like, this man says that we can ignore Moses. And Paul's like, uh-uh. False. And they're like, they're, we, need to put, we need to put you to death, Paul. And Paul says, if there's any merit to their commands, I don't seek to escape death. Like, wouldn't that have been, when Paul's on trial for his life, wouldn't that have been Paul's opportunity to say, like, yeah, Moses, we, we don't need all that stuff anymore, guys, because that would mean I would be put to death, and I don't want to be put to death. Yeah. But, but he said, I wouldn't seek to escape, because Moses is good. And that's not just a simple, that means we do everything exactly as it is in the Old Testament either, though. Why not? Because, I would say it's steeper. Well, it's very clear. I Even can't. foods are open. Are they? God said but so. Here's he the, said, don't but, call unclean what God has called clean. And he, but what was the in description the, in of that dream? presentation of all of the unclean have a longer foods. conversation <laughs> another day. What was it? The, the, did the interpretation of the dream follow? The, the interpretation of the dream was not, you can eat anything you want. The interpretation of the dream was, I've cleansed the Gentiles. Go to them, Peter, because I told you to. Yeah, my whole, my whole thing, I, I use a different past. line of reasoning where um, Paul says that um, if a man had an unbelieving spouse, then the children would be unholy. But because Christ, because now... The queen cleanses. Now, but because, because, of, because of Christ, now, now if a man has an unbelieving wife, their children are holy. Otherwise, they would be unholy. So I would say if a man lying with his wife cleanses, makes, produces clean offspring, if a man lying with his wife, so I, the, whole, the whole pattern of which wins out when something clean and unclean come into contact. In the Old Covenant, the unclean thing always won. It defiled the clean thing. In the New Covenant, getting back to that Ezekiel's vision of the third temple, the, uh, the queen holy of holies starts issuing water that comes out from underneath the threshold back. of the temple. And everywhere it goes, it cleanses, it turns salt water to fresh, produces trees with leaves for healing. Sure. So now the pattern is, it used to be if you, you, know, you had to keep unclean things away because you would defile things in the holy of holies. Well, now the pattern is reversed. Now the Holy of Holies comes out and it, clean, it goes out and it cleanses the whole world. So the, the problem, pattern used to be the unclean thing would win. And now through the power of Christ, he would go and he would touch lepers. And instead of him being made unclean, now you're not a leper anymore. So I think the pattern has been reversed. If it's an unclean food or if it's an unclean spouse, you by touch, I think by a clean person, cleanses that thing. The thing about the food, though, is the food wasn't just unclean. The food... Or actually, no, let me say it this way. The, the flesh of the animals that he prohibited were never considered food. They were not to be con even thought of as food. They were abominations. So they're not just unclean, they're abominations. They're supposed to be abominable to them. It's like saying that poison ivy is food. It's not food, you don't eat it. He told actually, them the things that they... That's funny, funny thing. Well, okay. Funny thing. If eating, you dilute eating, it, sure. Eating poison ivy actually helps you build a resistance okay. to it. Bad, exa <laughs> bad example. But the point <laughs> is, is God was defining those, for those them what was food. Those things were considered food, and God was saying, these are not food for you. And then... Oh, no. And then this he said, you're not to put, eat the same things that they're eating. They're not food for you. You are right. to consider they're not them not for food. You. They, which applies it, to us. It is a food. It was not food for them particularly. And then, and part of the reason I say that is then what does he tell Peter? He doesn't tell Peter, look at this. This is now okay. No, he says, get your fork and take a bite. But R Rise, kill, and eat. But it's the point eat. of so the, the dream thing, was... The thing that is, you're right, it would be, to him, he would think of that as eating poison, most likely. But God still says, eat. It's not... 
Um, I really don't want to leave it here, but I really got to jump. <laughs> we'll let you go. I got to pick up my kids. We but need to get we'll together to do and a, talk about a chapter it. two. Yeah.